Hey folks, welcome back to class. Um, hope you're doing well. Hope your families are doing well. Hope you had a good break. Um, let me talk just a little bit about our plan for the rest of the semester, okay? We are going to be working on a week-to-week -week basis. So each week, I'll give you a lecture, a PowerPoint presentation, maybe a couple videos to watch, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, make a post on D2L just one or two paragraphs explaining uh, maybe something that you thought about during the lecture, something that relates to your life. Um, and then I'm gonna ask you guys to comment at least on one of your classmates' uh, posts. So, you know, half, of our, half our grade in this class comes from attendance. And since you can't be here in Charleston and here at the university, uh, we're gonna do the next best thing. And so that's gonna be how I'm checking in with you to make sure that you're attending our virtual class for the next few weeks. So each week I'll post an update in D2L. It'll be in our content section. Uh, and I'll ask you to um, watch or listen to a lecture, read through some notes that I have, maybe watch a video or two, and then write a post under our discussion forums about that. I'll email you uh, information on how to access all those, okay? We'll still have a few more uh, reading assignments that I'll have as well, just so we have something to grade you on for the semester. Uh, and then finally, I wanna to talk to you about our media research project, okay? If you've already spoken to a reporter, an editor, somebody for your interview, you're good to go. Proceed as you normally would, okay? If you've already got an appointment with one of those folks for an interview and they're still able to do that by phone or by email, you're golden. Stick with that. Continue with the assignment as it is. But a lot of newsrooms are going to be really, really busy for the next month because their routines have changed just like everyone else's. Uh, a lot of them have gone to shift work where people are working from home or people are coming and going from the newsroom so they're not in contact with each other. A lot of people are working really, really long hours to cover this uh, coronavirus crisis, okay? So it's quite possible that you're not going to be able to get a journalist to spend that time with you. If you can't arrange an interview, I'm going to propose um, an alternative that you can do. It'll be another research paper and I'll have details about it on D2L, but basically what I'm going to ask you to do, if you're not able to do that interview, is I'm going to ask you to uh, compare the coverage of this COVID-19 situation from different news outlets and I'm going to ask you to talk to people around you, uh, whether in person or online, about how they're getting information about this situation. Okay, so look for um, that information on D2L in the coming days. That's an alternative if you're not able to arrange an interview with a journalist, okay? I'm available for questions uh, by email anytime. All right, so now let me give you just a brief lecture for our first week back. And what we're gonna talk about these next few minutes um, is personal bias and what we call information bubbles. Information bubbles, okay? So you remember we've been talking a lot about philosophers like John Stuart Mill who talked about the idea that we need to have a marketplace of ideas where we have always access to new information, to better information, to new points of view so that we can grow personally, so that we can learn new things as individuals and as a society. Uh, and Mill and people before him and after him saw that any law that kept people from expressing themselves would keep people also from getting that new information or those new points of view. But there are other things beyond law, beyond government, that can keep us from getting new information too. And that's what we're gonna talk about when we talk about bubbles and personal bias. First, I wanna to talk to you about a concept called 
anchoring bias. Anchoring bias, think about what an anchor is. An anchor is a weight that you drop off of a ship or a boat to keep you from moving around, right? Anchoring bias is when we have a tendency to give more weight to the first information we get, okay? So think about this, you move into uh, an apartment building off campus and uh, you know, a friend of yours who lives there says, oh, this girl down the hall is kind of arrogant, okay? You're gonna have that in the back of your mind because that's the first thing you've heard about this person. And it's gonna take a lot of new information for you to get past that initial idea, right? So if you think that another person, you've been told that they are arrogant or unpleasant, you're gonna to tend to believe that until there's a whole bunch of information to overcome it, okay? So we tend to give more weight to the first information we get, and that affects our view going forward. You, you, you've heard people say, you only get one chance to make a first impression. That's what we're talking about. So when you first get a piece of information, you're going to have to, you're gonna have a tendency to believe that even in spite of a little bit of information to the contrary, okay? Anchoring bias, that's what we call that. This happens too if you're going to like buy a car, for example. If a car is on the lot and it's got a sticker price of $27,000, that's gonna be your starting point, is that this is a $27,000 car. It may not be. So if you talk the, the dealership down to selling you the car for $25,000, you think of it as a $2,000 savings because you're basing your information on the first piece of information you got about that car, anchoring bias. If you were just told the car was $25,000 and you got it for $25,000, it doesn't seem like as much of a deal for you because $25,000 is the first piece of information you got. Okay? There's a related concept called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is where we seek or interpret evidence in ways that are partial to our existing beliefs, expectations, or hypotheses. Okay? What does that mean? That means that if I'm convinced that um, young people can't get coronavirus, okay? I am going to be looking for cases of senior citizens getting the virus or people over 40 getting the virus. I'm not gonna go looking for uh, cases of younger people getting the virus, okay? And of course, young people can get the virus, we know that. That's confirmation bias. You are seeking out or paying more attention to information that proves what you already think, okay? Why do we do this? So our human minds are always seeking uh, patterns, uh, narratives. Remember we talked about narratives. Who's, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy? And if we had to constantly reevaluate everything that we already knew, that would be exhausting. That would wear you out, okay? So we prefer to build on what we know. Okay, you do this in school, you learn that one plus one is two, then you learn that two times two is four, and, 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 and four divided by two is two. You're always building on existing information. You wouldn't get anywhere if you had to constantly re-examine everything you knew. But the problem is with confirmation bias, sometimes we do form ideas that are not quite accurate, and so we are looking for information that backs up what we believe, politically, ethically, morally, what have you. There are two kinds of confirmation bias. There's motivated confirmation bias. Um, this is where we treat evidence in a biased way to preserve beliefs that we want to keep, okay? So if we like thinking that, um, you know, if we like thinking that human beings don't have a contributing factor to climate change, that's a belief that we like, and we're gonna, sorry, that's my dog barking. That's a belief that we may like, and so we're gonna look for 
any evidence that backs up what we believe because it's in our interest to believe what we believe. There's also unmotivated confirmation bias. This is where we treat evidence in a biased way to preserve our conclusions whether we want to or not. Okay? So, for example, you may have come to a conclusion that your community has a high level of crime relative to other places. And so every time you see a story about crime happening, that's going to reinforce your existing conclusion. That may not be in your best interest to think that you're living in a high crime neighborhood, but that confirmation bias causes you to take in only information that's going to back up your conclusion, even if it's a conclusion that doesn't make you feel particularly good. What is the impact of those patterns of thought, of anchoring bias and confirmation bias? One, it can lead to political polarization. So one of the things we talk about these days is something called negative political polarization. This is the idea that people are less um, politically motivated by their own beliefs than they are by disliking people who disagree with them. And there's polling that shows more and more people would be opposed to the idea of their kids marrying somebody of a different political point of view. Okay. Personal relationships. This is the example of the apartment that I used earlier. If you reach a conclusion about another person that's negative or that's positive, you may not be able to act, you know, accurately make a judgment about their character because you're being influenced by your first conclusion. Racial and ethnic biases happen the same way. If you see or gender biases happen the same way. Um, if you have in your mind that uh, scientists are overwhelmingly male, you may be less inclined to pay attention to scientists who are female. Um, so stereotypes, again, stereotypes are pre-existing biases and Confirmation bias causes people to hold on to those stereotypes, even against evidence that they're just not true. Even in academic and professional research, this is why we, you know, when we do scientific research, we have double blind studies where you're trying to take the researcher's point of view out of the research as much as you can. Because if you're a researcher and you have a hypothesis about your research topic, you know, you may be trying to prove that true. And that may, that may affect your judgments and how you carry out your research because you're trying to confirm what you already suspect, okay? On a related note, to overcome confirmation bias and anchoring bias, you have to constantly have access to new information. And one of the problems that we have, especially in this day and age, is that People in this country tend to live with people who have similar points of view that they do. Okay, so for example, people who tend to be more liberal tend to live in certain cities. People who tend to be more conservative tend to live in, live in certain suburbs and in rural communities. Okay, what's the problem there? The problem is that people aren't coming into contact with people that have different points of view. They're only surrounded by people that have their same points of view. And so there's less information and less um, pushback that would cause people to question their existing biases. Uh, for example, in the 2016 election, 80% of counties in this country were considered landslide counties. That's where one political party won by at least 20% of the vote. So an overwhelming number of people in most counties have just one political point of view. Uh, some of this, researchers say, comes from lifestyle choices. Um, but the results are that people increasingly aren't associated with others that have different political points of view. At the same time, we used to have a lot of institutions that sort of bridged gaps and that introduced people with different points of view to each other. Okay, so you had uh, houses of worship, you had fraternal organizations like the Elks or the Moose Lodge or the Oddfellows. 
You had service organizations like the Parent Teacher Association. And you had labor unions that lots of different people with different points of view, different ethnic racial backgrounds were part of. And a lot of those institutions have deteriorated. Robert Putnam, who's a researcher at Harvard University, uh, calls this a loss of social capital. Okay. Um, as those institutions that brought people together have deteriorated, a lot of our media have sorted out. We talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about affirmation journalism, right? There's a lot of reporting or uh, news programming, especially on cable TV and online, that approaches the news from a particular point of view and seeks to reinforce that, okay? Um, Social media does this especially because social media platforms are built to introduce you to material that they think you'll like. You know, that's why some people show up in your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed when others don't. And the tendency there is the people that have a, political, a particular political point of view on social media are only inclined to see people that have their same point of view. So later on in the semester, we're going to talk about what we can all do to have access to a wide variety of information. So we're not just hearing from people that agree with us, because remember what, what Mills said, if you're only hearing from people that agree with you, you don't have the potential to learn. Okay? So uh, that's my uh, lecture on uh, bias and bubbles. One area that really has come up a lot lately in reinforcing some of these divisions among people and in reaffirming their biases is what we call outrage reporting. Outrage reporting. I'm going to, uh, underneath of this lecture online, I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation about outrage reporting. How you can recognize it, uh, how it plays on our emotions, and how oftentimes things that are presented as newsworthy because of their level of outrage may not be that newsworthy after all. So do, do yourself a favor, have a look through that lecture, and then don't forget to, uh, to post uh, a point of view about, um, about that lecture and this lecture uh, there on our forum. So uh, I'll talk to you next week, and I'll be talking to you by email and on D2L. So. Have a good day. Take care.